So I want to start off with thanking everyone uh, for joining us today and also for thanking the Syria campaign for organizing this incredibly important and very sadly timely webinar, The Urgent Need to End Starvation, Atrocity, Crimes, Lessons from Syria to Gaza, Palestine. Uh, my name is Arwa Damon. I was a correspondent with CNN for about 17 years. I left two years ago. I founded a charity, Inada, in 2015. I have spent a lot of time in both Syria and Gaza, both as a journalist and as a humanitarian. And as such, I just want to reiterate my gratitude um, for the organization of this conversation, for our lovely panelists, and for all of you for, for joining us. It, it's a very heavy topic, but it's a very important one. Uh, to start us off, I would like to ask our panelists to initially um, introduce themselves. Um, if we could start uh, with Nahid, please. Thank you, everyone. I'm very honored and delighted to be joining you today. Uh, my background is in law and Islamic studies, and uh, I've been following very closely the International Court of Justice uh, um, jurisprudence on the question of genocide in Gaza. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Mariana? Uh, thank you, everyone, and thank you for having me today. Uh, my name is Mariana Kerkutli. I'm a legal investigator and a co-founder of Hapuqiyat, a Syrian woman civil society organization that works on accountability and advocacy in relation to international core crimes that happened in Syria. Happy to be here today. Thank you, Katriona. Hi, pleasure to be here. I'm Katrina Murdoch. I'm one of the partners at Global Rights Compliance, where I lead our starvation and humanitarian crisis portfolio. Thank you. And last but not least, Ur. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. My name is Ur Inger. I'm professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at the NIOT Institute uh, in Amsterdam. And I specialize in uh, the history of mass violence in the Middle East. Um, before we get into this conversation, though, um, we would like to start with a recorded reading from Isam, who is a poet from Gaza, whose poetry quite passionately uh, serves to depict the, the very harsh reality of, of the occupation. في عقله الحكم أشعر أن ما يحدث هو النهاية وغزة هي الوتد الذي يحرك العالم إلى الوراء على لسان أحد النازحين قال لي أن أخيه في شمال غزة وهو يحاول الحصول على كيس طحين لأمه التي تموت من الجوع قام الاحتلال بإطلاق النار عليه وسط في مكان فقال لرجل آخر يحمل كيس صحيح آخر أن يحمل كيسه إلى أمه وهذه كانت وصيته الأخيرة العالم أمام اختبار عظيم ارتجف له الأبدان ولا يدرك هذه المحنة إلا من في قلبه عافية وفي عقله حكم بعد انتهاء هذه الحرب البشعة في غزة سوف يبدأ العالم في عده التنازل لأن غزة كانت الاختبار الذي يحدد فيه كيف النجاة حرب التجويع التي بدأها الاحتلال منذ أكثر من سبعين عام يتفاقم في هذه الحرب غزة تعرض لقتل بطيء عن طريق تقليص المساعدات وجميع الدول تشاهد هذا الموت دون شعور بالذنب لذلك اضطر للذهاب إلى رفح والمخاطرة بحياتك من أجل تأمين بعض الأغراض غير الموجودة وهناك تبدأ في رحلة البحث عما تريد في الزحام بين المئات من الناس ليأخذ هذا المشوار يومك بالكامل 
وخوفا من الليل عليك ان تعود قبل الساعه السادسه مساء هذا التضييق والحصار على شمال وجنوب قطاع غزه والاباده التي ترتكب كل يوم بحق غزه ما هو الا اختبار امام الله وامام الجميع ومن سوف ينجو هو فقط من يمد يده لغزه That is um, a very beautiful and and painful piece. Um, so just to sort of set the scene of what Gaza looks like now, uh, we do know that every single person, 2.2 million people right now are food insecure. We do know that especially in the North of the country, Uh, dozens of children have died uh, due to starvation, malnutrition, and dehydration. We have repeatedly been hearing warnings from the United Nations and other organizations about how famine is imminent, if not already taking place. We do know that humanitarian organizations access uh, to a population in need is being severely um, and detrimentally inhibited. So with all that being said, Nahed, to start with you, what is the role of starvation in international law and specifically with, with respect to Gaza today? Thank you very much again for this very kind invitation to speak on uh, the urgent need to end starvation atrocity crimes. Now, starvation has had a long history uh, as a method of warfare uh, and also as a tool of genocide. And by starvation, uh, uh, what is meant here is the deprivation, uh, sorry, depriving a population of access to food, water, and other means to sustain life. And this also includes the with object indispensable for the survival of the civilian population. So basically everything needed to prepare and cook food from clean water to a stove or an oven. And importantly, and the deprivation of food, starvation, can be used to pursue policies that systematically target groups that, and that can be potentially even more widespread than the acts of killing themselves. Now, to talk about starvation as a tool of genocide, I would like to refer to the UN Genocide Convention, as well as to the modified second provisional measures the International Court of Justice has issued uh, late March 2024. And that was necessary, a second set, a modified set of provisional measures, because obviously the humanitarian situation in Gaza has become so uh, bad that um, even the first a set of provisional measures where uh, the court has already ordered Israel to uh, improve um, the uh, humanitarian situation of Palestinians uh, was not followed, clearly not followed. And we know that also, uh, you know, reports from NGOs. Um, but so I want to stress that the, for the International Court of Justice, the second round of provisional measures, they made it very clear that um, the civilian population in Gaza was extremely vulnerable. Uh, noting that many Palestinians in the Gaza Strip had no access to the basic foodstuffs, potable water, electricity, and uh, essential medicines or heating. And I want to stress that this is relevant for the question of genocide, right? For the genocide unfolding before our eyes. And I want to, you know, stress just a few kind of quotes, if I may, Arwa, to see basically, you know, where is that information um, coming from for the, for the ICJ to say exactly this. So. They bring together, they quote, you know, that's that's the important part. They quote from all these updated reports on food, food security phase classification, global initiative, whether it's from the World Food Program, um, the World Health Organization, that's all relevant because one, we know that th this is the material that the International Court of Justice will decide upon on the question of genocide, but it's also relevant, uh, and I'm going to say a bit more about this in a bit, as for what is it that the world knows? What is it then that the, that, that the law has to do with this information available? And maybe I just want to, you know, make it very clear that, uh, and you already quoted that, uh, Arwa, the International Court of Justice is aware that not only is there a risk 
of famine, as they noted in the first set of provisional measures, but that famine is setting in, that children have already died of mal malnutrition and dehydration. And they quote also the uh, United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, that this is the highest share of people facing that level of food insecurity ever recorded worldwide. Uh, and they go on saying the court, unfortunately, as grim as the picture we see today is, there's every possibility for further deterioration, military operations, insecurity, and extensive restrictions on the entry and delivery of essential goods have decimated food production and agriculture. So this this is, you know, again, you know, we're talking here about, you know, elements um, of of genocide that that we're seeing today, and the International Court of Justice even goes on to say that uh, whatever you know, basically that the humanitarian uh, assistance that either Israel has provided or others during while the air and sea routes, they might be helpful under the present circumstances, but there are no there are no substitute for land routes and entry points from Israel into Gaza to ensure the effective and efficient delivery of food, water, medical, and humanitarian assistance. And here, really, I'm quoting from the International Court of Justice, right? Um, and so it's important um, uh, to see that this is, um, uh, you know, like a, a situation of starvation. And maybe I want to also... Uh, you know, here of starvation, but also famine in particular as a technical term. Uh, so it's an officially declared technical term when there is a series of specific food insecurity, mortality, and malnutrition criteria. When their malnutrition criteria are met, uh, famine is defined as the most severe kind of hunger crisis. And when it occurs, it means that there's an extreme shortage of food and several children and adults within a certain area are dying of hunger on a daily basis. And so some, while we know that there are deadly emergen emergencies that can happen, like earthquakes, and floods and other natural disasters. With famine, this is not the case. It's not something that happens suddenly, but rather famines are, um, they're not, famines are not inevitable because they're always predictable, preventable, and man-made. And this is exactly the kind of information that is all taking into consideration for the question of genocide. Yeah, and I'm sure, um, you know, you've seen that there's this sort of bizarre minimum calorie count to survive kind of mathematics that that is done. But I think if I'm not mistaken, the number out there um, that is that most Gazans are consuming around 425 to 500 calories uh, a day. Do you think that then in sort of cutting off um, electricity, water, and humanitarian access initially that the Israeli government was already declaring its intent to commit genocide? And what can, or how do you think international courts will will deal with starvation as, as a tool of genocide? Right. So obviously for the intent to genocide, there are two things that are relevant. One is the statements of the politicians and those in the, in the military that have command authority. Even when we, uh, which we have, right, in which the court kind of stated, I mean, they, they state, they quoted statements, right, with that, you know, uh, can be referencing or, you know, kind of evidence the intent. But even in the absence of that, these kind of statements, the court will look at a pattern of conduct, right? And the, the, the fact that there's a second round of provisional measures uh, clearly indicates, uh, obviously, that not only the report, has submitted after the first uh, interim ruling, but also its conduct uh, is not uh, seen as sufficient to um, assume that there is no um, intent. But I think what is really important here is two things. One is with the question of genocide, um, we have a kind of dual responsibility, the responsibility of a state, and that's why this question is being uh, um, followed um, and discussed before the International Court of Justice, but also the responsibility of internationals, which, uh, sorry, individuals, which also means that the International Criminal Court at one point will have to step in and see what is the individual um, responsibility here of uh, people who have command authority and people who are you know, deliberately blocking the delivery of aid and food and fuel into Gaza uh, and, and are impeding humanitarian assistance. Now, I think um, 
I, I, you know, especially with the video you just showed, right? It is important to kind of put the question of international law and international courts also to what that means for people in Palestine, right? And unfortunately, at this point, I think it's um, it is, it remains important to do both to realize that the situation for Palestinians is not improving, but rather deteriorating day by day, but also uphold the very kind of possibilities of telling their stories within the frame of international law, that forum of the courts where people uh, in the courts and, and beyond obviously the courts have a chance um, to to not only tell and narrate their story, um, uh, but also to seek accountability. And accountability in this case actually means reparations, restitutions, and maybe most importantly, also rehumanization. Yeah, and the, the, the rehumanization point that you bring up there is just so, so important because uh, Katrina, you know, you and I were discussing this earlier, This the whole byproduct kind of of living in in a situation where you're displaced and you're starving and and you're 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 humiliated and you're reduced to begging and pleading just to be able to to survive is also grotesquely dehumanizing um in many ways and you know we were we were having this whole discussion about how you know starvation isn't necessarily properly investigated in in a lot of legal analysis that happens it's been overlooked to a certain degree um it, it kind of gets lumped into this whole oh it's a poverty it's a humanitarian issue versus uh being being a criminal issue so wh why do you think that has been the case um in terms of legal analysis and investigations and, and prosecutions and how do you think the the war in gaza might start to change that Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great question. And I think echoing your opening comment, I think I just want to also at the outset um, express my thanks to, to the Syria campaign for putting this conversation together. Um, and also really, as you said, to try and acknowledge, I think, a little bit the, um, the sorrow, I think, that these two conflicts have and continue to have on these communities. And I think for those communities, families and friends and colleagues who have joined today. Um, I think it's a really important conversation as traumatizing as as complex as, as it is. Um, I think I think that the, the key sort of part to this in in many ways, at least in in my view from a from the legal perspective, is just picking up a little bit what Nahid said as well in terms of the language around starvation and labeling it and, and its definition. And I think that um, that piece is is something we've been working on for really the last seven years now across various conflicts, and the language is is so inconsistent and and at times I think deliberately so, and and as you as you mentioned, Arwa, I think that the labelling to this part of the conflict in in Gaza and in and in Syria is is critical. Um, the terms kind of hunger, famine, food insecurity, other associated terms, they really don't always encapsulate what is an international criminal law violation or, or an act of genocide. Uh, and this is also really true across certain dialects and languages. Um, and so understanding that piece, I think, is, is a really critical point to how the crime will be enabled to be monitored, prevented and, and ultimately prosecuted. Um, from a victim and survivor point of view as well, I think that the labelling is really, really critical to that recognition to individuals and communities who are enduring this crime. Um, it, as you say, it's it's really unique in the way that it manifests itself in, in a lot of psychological, physically painful and degrading acts and consequences which are often really separated in time from the acts of a perpetrator and then kind of build slowly and cumulatively. And I think in, in many ways that has been one of the challenges from an investigative and prosecutorial point of view, because it has this slow tail. Um, what we're seeing though in, in Gaza is, is, you know, the speed with which this is unfolding and the 
speed with which you're seeing an impact happening is really quite unusual. And you mentioned that, the, that there's already deaths from starvation and malnutrition. And I think the latest figures we saw, which are, I'm sure grossly underestimated, are, are 32 deaths. I think 16, no, sorry, 31, and, and of, of which were 28 children. Um, so why this crime hasn't been prosecuted and, and why it hasn't been investigated and it's sort of fallen outside of the international criminal law wheelhouse i think there's there's a number of different reasons for that um and we've really kind of dug into to what those might be over the last few years and i think for the purposes of today maybe just to mention four i think in the first instance in some of the other conflicts that we saw rwanda in particular uh in, in that genocide the the facts didn't arise in that case it wasn't it, it wasn't sort of prosecuted investigated because it wasn't part of that fact pattern I think the second reason is that there was no distinct crime of starvation before the international criminal tribunals for Yugoslavia and Rwanda and the um, extraordinary chambers in Cambodia, which in the latter case is actually quite ex extraordinary in and of itself, given the high numbers of starvation um, and, and uh, malnutrition that happened in Cambodia. Um, Addition. I think there's another kind of procedural bar behind this, which was that most of these crimes and conflicts are occurring in non-international armed conflicts. And that crime, the Rome Statute wasn't amended until 2019. So there was just no mechanism with which to prosecute and investigate this directly. Of course, there's a, a you know a number of alternative crimes that could be used, and certainly they were. But going back to that kind of expressive labeling point of view as a distinct standalone crime, I think this was one of the big challenges. I think the third challenge, and again, or the third reason perhaps is something that you touched upon is that starvation as a humanitarian law issue is often framed in this kind of humanitarian response. And we're seeing that really, really clearly in the context of Gaza and it's it's deliberate in many ways it's it's placed as a humanitarian emergency rather than a criminal pattern of events or a criminal conduct um, and therefore the the focus becomes on uh, humanitarian relief and, and aid rather than investigations and the looking at this as an atrocity commission and then I would say the sort of fourth significant challenge which we've kind of touched upon is is the multi-causal nature and multifaceted effect of starvation. So I think, you know, again, thinking about the context of Gaza, you know, this food insecurity in Gaza is, is, is not new. The sieges are not new. The deprivation of objects indispensable to survival, a calorific program to restrict and starve a population. None of these are new. You know, food insecurity was pre-existing pre-October. But what you're seeing is, is very, very clear impacts as a result of that pre-existing insecurity. Um, so I'd say that, that those are some of the main challenges as to why, um, as a distinct standalone crime, it's just sort of fallen outside of international criminal law prosecutions and investigations um, and seen very much as this sort of inevitable byproduct of conflict. And I think as we were talking yesterday, you know, there's these parallels with sexual and gender based violence where I think starvation and food insecurity is just very much seen in conflict as just an inevitable byproduct, you know, a bit of a, as it was with sexual and gender based violence, a sort of boys will be boys attitude. You know, this is something that just happens in conflict. People move, people are hungry, you know, critical infrastructure is attacked and it's sort of dismissed in that way. Um, and and sort of, I think when you look at the patterns and look at how this is manifesting across numerous conflicts, it's a very, very clear pattern and a very clear strategic method of warfare that is being used and is being is being missed from uh, large quarters of, of accountability um, mechanisms. So then how do you start to change that? How do you legally start to try to sort of derive whatever it is that needs to be derived to prohibit the starvation of civilians or even yeah. the use of starvation as a weapon of war. And then I was also wanting to refer back to what you said. You said the language around it is inconsistent and deliberately so. What do you mean by that? 
Well, I, I think on 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 that one, I think it's you know not always deliberate. Um, I think there is misunderstandings, misconceptions, um, inaccurate reporting from from kind of swathes of 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 individuals. But I think there is a um, a convenience with which to label this as a humanitarian crisis rather than a, uh, a you know a criminal course of conduct or a method of warfare that would attract international criminal law or international accountability. It's much easier to frame this as an issue of humanitarian aid not coming in rather than humanitarian aid convoys being attacked or borders being closed deliberately preventing uh, you know humanitarian aid and emergency relief coming through. Um, and then to the to the first question or, or, or the sort of first part to that as to what can we do? I mean, I think what I would say is that there's been, despite um, this really being a, a very, very challenging area of, of law and it's still being very much in its infancy, I would say that in the last six years, there really has been an extraordinary development of, of an extraordinary progress, really, in many ways. As we know, international criminal law, it moves, and, and generally all law, I would say it moves very, very slowly. Um, but in the last six years, I think what we've seen is, uh, you know, a unanimous um, Security Council resolution, 2417. We've seen a, a Rome Statute amendment. We've seen commissions of inquiry uh, and accountability mechanisms re really starting to focus in on this crime. And I think that that is a significant development and a si significant reason to be to be positive and, and optimistic that we'll start to see this changing. Um, that said, I think what really needs to happen in the work that global rights compliance is, has been really focused on is, is in that engagement piece. It's sort of around analysis, advocacy and, and accountability and really our engagement with commissions of inquiry, with stakeholders, with European war crimes units, with various prosecution and accountability mechanisms to ensure that this crime is within their mandates, within their purview, and really kind of, you know, desensitizing as to why this can be prosecuted, why it is no um, more challenging than any other international criminal law um, under the Rome Statute, and why there are opportunities and, and organizations that are perfectly, you know, equipped to be able to look at this. Um, and to be able to move that dial forward. So I think that there is, um, there's a lot to be optimistic about in terms of where we might see this developing, but it's around that sort of ensuring that that labeling is right, ensuring that accountability mechanisms are including this in their investigative mandates and ensuring that the, the Security Council resolution and the Rome statute are, are properly implemented. I mean, that last point that you make there might be the toughest part in all of this, given that we historically know that, you know, Israel and other governments regularly ignore um, both the UN and, and international law. Um, unfortunately, sadly, we do have a lot of examples uh, in the region of, of starvation and sieges and Mariana. Um, you know, specifically, if we're going to talk about the siege that happened in in the south of of Damascus, you know how how did that unfold? What was that like for the population? What were they able to eat? And if if you do happen to know, kind of what what were the the longer lasting impacts of that on people that managed to actually survive? Thank you, Edouard. Uh, it's really devastating to watch an, um, a, a pattern of a crime that we've been looking at together with my colleague Leila since 2020 unfolding in front of our eyes today in Gaza. Uh, I just wanted to make this statement and, and still unfolding in other areas in the world. Um, the situation in Yarmouk was as such, um, civilians basic the Syrian regime basically used siege and starvation in different areas in the country. So Syri civilians in besieged areas throughout the country had been encircled, trapped, prevented from leaving, indiscriminately bombed and killed. They were starved and routinely denied medical evacuations and the delivery of vital foodstuff, healthy items and other essential supplies. 
our investigation and also research has shown that the meal or starve policy that the Syrian regime was using at the time uh, in the south of Damascus referred to a pattern of conduct used by the Syrian regime to force capitulation in, uh, in opposition held areas. So it was basically publicly advertised by the Syrian regime and its militias on graffiti that were shown on, on different walls or at checkpoints with the um, title of the campaign, Meal or Stop. It all started unfolding with uh, an attack uh, that happened in December 2012 uh, on the south of Damascus uh, that uh, initially um, attacked uh, a mosque that was called Abdul Qadir al Husseini. Uh, four schools, two of them were hosting uh, uh, internally displaced uh, people. And gradually, then uh, from uh, uh, almost early 2013 until March 2014, uh, the siege of the south of Damascus occurred. In the beginning, it started with a partial siege, and then it moved with a, 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 a full siege, basically, which was referred to by the local community as the Hisar al Khanik. Uh, in the partial siege, uh, people were allowed uh, to enter. The, the siege first was upholded by checkpoints, by different checkpoints from different entries of the area, and people were allowed to enter the areas with a little, limited amount of food stock that were, in the most of the cases, were not sufficient. Uh, for their uh, for their living, and with the sealed se with the full uh, siege, no food and nothing was allowed to enter, and no no one was allowed to enter or leave. In the time of partial siege, women uh, and elderly would move through the checkpoints because for young men and men it was very dangerous uh, to move through checkpoints because of enforced disappearance or arbitrary arrests. A lot of uh, witnesses uh, who we talked to, and also uh, in in for, for this particular. Uh, event research participants as well, uh, reflecting on the research we developed, uh, a lot of young women informed us that they witnessed uh, arbitrary arrests uh, of young men from the checkpoints happening in front of them. With the complete siege, no one was allowed to enter or leave, which made the population in the area. Yarmouk also, just to give an explanation, is a residential area. It's not an agricultural area, meaning that there are no means of food in the area uh, in, in any way, shape or form. There are no farmers, there are no uh, agriculture land. Uh, so basically um, the food started uh, getting less and less from people's homes until it, start, it, it was uh, completely done. Unlike agricultural land where farmers or also non-farmers who had some knowledge of farming would actually be able to farm certain seasonal uh, vegetables, not fruits, fruits were more uh, in the eastern Ruta parts, while in the south of Damascus, in the areas we were looking at, Yelda, Beit Sahem, Babila, Yermouk, uh, the, this was not uh, an option. Um, in August 2013, Amnesty International published uh, the first report mentioning the first death uh, of malnutrition due to starvation in Yermouk. Uh, and then between um, October 2013 and January 2014, which was the toughest period where it was winter, the, the Yarmouk Palestinian camp was completely sealed off. Uh, there was no entry of food. Uh, the, the three uh, causes, main causes of death that were listed were starvation, lack of adequate uh, medical care and shooting by snipers. Uh, after sealing off uh, the uh, the Yarmou camp, uh, hospitals, bakeries were targeted and doctors were sniped at, uh, leaving uh, people living in the area under shelling and bombing that was constant at the time without any potential to go to any medical facility because medical facilities were very limited, medical equipments as well that could support people. Uh, uh, and people like people's health would also be limited. So those would be other even reasons for people to um, uh, to die during the siege period. In terms of food availabilities and alternatives, um, in the beginning, people were saving some food in their homes, so they would use uh, the food that they they had already. But then, in a couple of months, the food was done. There was no more food, especially in Yermouk. Uh, people started eating uh, a plant called, um, uh, where it ref was referred to by the local community as Rajul al Asfura, sparrow leg. Uh, in English, it is the uh, Karyophyllachia, which is basically a poisonous uh, plant. Uh, when eaten, uh, people, you cannot eat it. It's, it's, it does not taste well at all. You have to boil it again and again to be able to make it edible. 
and uh, it uh, re reportedly a lot of people, especially children, would have swelling around their eyes and severe diarrhea, which led in very young children to death. Uh, to the cause of death. Um, uh, people also would uh, cook, uh, cook at the time spice soup, uh, put a lot of spices within boiled water, big pots of bo boiled water for, for to cover for the needs for, for all the community, and but ha with, with it having no um, any substantial benefit for the body. Uh, some people also reported having to eat, uh, having had to eat cats and dogs and that they had uh, to hunt for. And uh, the uh, because also of the lack of uh, uh, food for uh, cows and sheep, cows and sheep would die, which for a period in the market out there, there was a lot of meat. But then this period ended very shortly because there was no way to, to store the meat because there was no electricity. And I will come back to the electricity and the water uh, in short. So the cattle, the food that was used for the cows and sheep would be used afterwards to be made to, to, to be used to make bread uh, for people to eat all kind of factors that with reportedly from uh, people we spoke to, uh, their dignity felt attacked at the time. They felt that they had to eat food that they would never eat in their life to survive if they even found this food. Um, so the, this kind of attack on a dignity was, uh, was reportedly uh, there. In addition to um, also the, the kind of lack of being able to provide uh, to your family members. All people we spoke to reported significant loss in themselves and relatives, and all reported knowing someone who died in in it, from starvation during this period, especially among elderly and children. In addition to the general food uh, shortage, also a shortage of milk and formula for children from from the early days of the siege was there. In, this impacted children and newborns with, who lost their life uh, due to that. In a lot of cases. Uh, food shortage as well and poor nutrition impacted women who were either pregnant during the siege or who were breastfeeding during the siege, who were not being able to breastfeed their newborns and as a result their newborns died uh, because of that. Uh, pregnant, uh, as I've mentioned, also the unavailability of milk and food in general also facilita facilitated alleged cases of sexual exploitation in which women were forced to exchange sexual, sexual favors for children's milk or food. We also looked at the electricity uh, factors, and as mentioned before, uh, the, the, the series regime cut off the main electricity as for April 2013 from the area. People had to depend on generators that were very costly. And uh, a lot of people did not have generators to use, so they had to make fire for them to themselves to eat. They would burn their furniture. They would burn plastic. That would lead to a long-lasting impact on their health when it comes to asthma, for example. Um, uh, access to water was also um, not present. People had to depend on wells that were, in most of the cases, uh, with germs and undrinkable, or that left in certain situations to people having hepatitis or liver inflammation. Those were basically uh, the main conditions that we managed to uh, get from the interviewees we spoke to in terms of long-lasting long lasting impacts that were physical and also psychological. A lot of people reported the fact that they, they could not be at home without having a lot of food when when there is a, a lack of food if of any substance they would uh, have a panic attack or they would be very afraid a lot of people reported that after leaving the siege they started eating a lot because they needed to fill uh, themselves and a lot of children as well live with the impact of the psychological impact of siege until today cat cat will be able to speak more to the psychological impact as well and its illegality and how the law looks at it but those are the cases that we have uh, reported. Um, after that period, there were uh, reconciliation committees in the areas uh, like Beit Sahem and Yelda and Babila. Uh, Yarmouk was uh, not uh, did not have a reconciliation committee, but had an agreement where people in a, a, a hardship of medical situation would be able to leave the area to get the treatment and then come back. They have to come back to the siege, so they just leave to get the medical treatment and come back. And uh, in March 2014, honorwa boxes started arriving to the Reje checkpoint uh, that was uh, upholding the siege of Yarmouk. I'll speak more about it uh, when we talk about uh, Mofa Adu, a case in Berlin. But that's it for me. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you. And actually, it might make more sense if you do go straight into specifically um, talking about about that case. Yeah, gladly. Um, in 23rd of March 2014, uh, honorwa boxes were arriving to the Reje checkpoint. The way that the boxes would arrive is that you would go to the Reje checkpoint, having your ID, showing it at the checkpoint, and after showing it, you get your, your box. If you show your ID and you are mentioned in any of the lists from either the militias that are controlling uh, the uh, checkpoint that are uh, basically working as the long arms of the Syrian regime or the Syrian regime members, you would be uh, detained uh, and uh, most probably and possibly disappeared. You, no one would know uh, where, where you are. On the 23rd of March 2014, as the Yonorwa humanitarian Brussels were being distributed, Mofa al uh, uh, committed, uh, who was uh, a member of um, a, a, an armed group that was linked to the Syrian regime, uh, fired a grenade against uh, the uh, civilians who were coming to receive uh, their boxes. As a result, a lot of people died and some people got injured. Some of those who got injured arrived to Germany and they uh, identified uh, Morfa al Due and uh, they uh, gave their testimonies um, to uh, the Syrian Center for Legal Studies and Research uh, and other um, civil society organizations as well. That led to uh, the center together with other, with other organizations opening, uh, uh, submitting a complaint to the prosecution authority in Germany and for this person uh, to be investigated and trialed. In February 2023, the, uh, the person was convicted uh, of four counts of murder as a war crime and two counts of attempted murder as a war crime. And uh, at the moment, he's serving uh, 15 years in Germany, which is the highest amount of a lifetime of prison in Germany, because the court has acknowledged the severity of the crime that he committed. Uh, the court uh, also referred its, in its judgment to the parcels for which civilians were waiting as boxes of death which to us reflected a bit of understanding of the court was a contextual understanding of the court of the situation in Yarmouk at the time. And the particularity of this case is that it is the first UJ case examining collaboration between the non-state military factions and the Syrian regime forces and highlighting the Syrian regime use of siege and starvation as a method of war warfare against the civilian population. That's um, it really makes a person pause and think, you know, that humanitarian aid is is also weaponized in in that way, and unfortunately, too many circumstances. Um, and unfortunately, we are somehow a species that actually has a global history of of genocide and of what's in quotations, uh, famine and genocides, and no one is better to speak to that. Then Ur. So if I could start with you, if you could just give us kind of like the, the historical overview of, of famine genocides with, with a focus on, on the Middle Eastern context. Yeah, thank you, Arwan. Uh, uh, thank you everybody for attending and, uh, and for presenting. Um, uh, of course, I mean, genocide has a, unfortunately uh, has been around as long as human beings have been around. So there's a long global history of uh, of of the the phenomenon, of course, the term only started uh, to uh, it became a legal term in 1948 with Rafael Lemkin and the United Nations Genocide Convention. Um, and genocide is too too often seen as a popular misconception that it is only ma mass murder. And so, if people are directly being killed, it's often seen as so this is genocide and should do something about it. But of course, plenty more genocides are consequences of indirect policies. Uh, often even uh, of slower processes uh, of violence. So think, for example, of uh, the genocide against the Native Americans and Aboriginals, for example, in Australia. Now, that's a procedure that took much longer and wasn't a matter of months. Uh, there too, um, famine, for example, also popular misconceptions that's often seen as a natural disaster. Uh, but of course, most of the time, uh, actually, most famines are consequences of political decisions, uh, and these uh, often they compound existing, for example, food insecurities, uh, and they can be crimes of commission, such as stealing off a country and then not allowing food in, but they can also be crimes of omission. Um, and so, and in most, let's say, modern genocides, let's say in 20th century, 21st century, 
starvation and famine and siege are always in some way involved. So almost every single genocide has an element to it where uh, the deliberate imposition of famine on the victim group or um, the a deliberate uh, negligence uh, of trying to feed a population uh, is part of it. Uh, so three interesting and I think important examples are to start off with, well, the Armenian genocide of 1915 was, of course, uh, in April, uh, 24 April 1915, when the then Turkish nationalist government uh, deported over a million and a half Armenians to the then really small uh, Syrian uh, town of Deir Ezzor, which of course nobody had heard of. Uh, most Armenians died uh, as a result of massacres, deprivations, and uh, just exposure. Uh, during that summer you know, of 1915. And very few made it to Deir Zor. But what's interesting is when you look at those survivors that made it to Deir Zor, um, that the Turkish government was kind of upset with the, the high number of survivors and then imposed a kind of racial hierarchy of nutrition on that city. So there were the Armenian survivors, for example, you know, languishing in, in on the edges of the city. Then there was the kind of the Arab uh, population, uh, the original population from Deir Zor, and then there were the Ottoman officials. And the higher up you were in this hierarchy, the better uh, nutrition you were allowed to uh, to get. For, for example, Armenians uh, received no bread, and this is already in the in a you know in a massive uh, scarcity and austerity situation in the First World War. Received no food. It was also not allowed to sell food to Armenians. And this, so this was deliberate uh, deliberate uh, um, segmentation in society to make sure people uh, die of uh, of starvation, basically. And if you go back 100 years, uh, there were campaigns, like international humanitarian campaigns, with posters that said, starving Armenians. If you just Google that, for example, you find those way back in what was then called Near East Relief. A second example is one of the most, let's say, important, prominent, well-known uh, historic genocides that were fundamentally consisted of a famine, which is the Ukrainian uh, Holodomor of 1933, 32, 33. This is when Ukraine is part of the Soviet Union. Soviet Union is run by Stalin, uh, and Stalin at some point to punish the Ukrainians, uh, sells off the country and, and requisitions all the grain from, from Ukraine, uh, exports all that grain, and prevents any grain and food from entering the country. As a result of which there are, um, we still don't have the exact number here, but any, anywhere between three and a half and five million uh, Ukrainians that die uh, within the time span of a year uh, of starvation. Uh, and everything that we know of that particular famine is interesting and is instructive. And so every genocide is an int interesting comment on another genocide, including the ongoing one. Namely that despite like local, uh, like Soviet officials warning Stalin, like, look, people are dying here and these people don't deserve to die. Despite that, Stalin kept on taking decisions uh, that, that compounded and that only exacerbated the, the starvation. And a third and final example here is of course, well, the Nazis, they planned to starve millions of people in Eastern Europe, right? The point was to uh, to annihilate uh, the European Jews and then to subject Polish and Ukrainian, let's say Russian, uh, Slavic populations to uh, a very cheap genocide, namely simply to uh, to uh, uh, to starve them. And one example is, that, of course, the siege of Leningrad, uh, which was it's a very interesting actually looking at historical parallels because there too, the city was sealed off uh, it's freezing in winter there. There's no food uh, production whatsoever. Um, and people started dying at a rate that was uh, un uh, unparalleled in modern history, to the extent that that's one of the few famine genocides, actually, in which cannibalism became really widespread. So people not only started eating corpses, but people started killing each other to eat each other. So, you know, it's, it's that level of de dehumanization we're at, basically. Now, um, uh, Mariana already uh, really uh, capably talked about uh, Syria and the sieges in Syria, and I think this, of course, is part of part of that continuum of, let's say, violence in the Middle East, in which uh, sieges and famines are used to punish, to starve, to destroy populations. And there are just um, three, I think, three elements that also need to be mentioned uh, before we go on to the Q and A. One is the the political dimension of uh, of siege um, and famine. Uh, so, of course, the external imposition of the siege is a prime responsible for the famine, right? And so in Israel here actually has almost godlike futures that they decide who lives and dies. But just like in the Ruta, in, a, in the Eastern Ruta, 
where also many Syrians, they spoke of the internal siege, which meant that uh, there were kind of political actors and war profiteers, which could be businessmen, or in the particular checkpoints, which could, which could be particular like um, armed factions, for example, militant factions, that were hoarding and limiting the food that came in, uh, only using a trickle for the uh, civilian population for their supporting everything for themselves. And then, of course, you get the emergence of black markets. And so all of that is also a matter of it. So here also, for example, um, so uh, there are uh, kind of uh, uh, Egyptian uh, organizations, for example, that organized uh, the flow of food into, into Gaza. And also the political actors inside Gaza are also, they, there's they, something they can contribute to the, to the compounding the violence. The second element, I think somebody mentioned it already, is of course psychological. I mean, dying from hunger is a, well, if there's a dignified way of dying, but it, it is a profoundly undignified way to die. Uh, at the end of a long uh, process of humiliation, you see indeed people uh, in a very undignified way debasing themselves, selling uh, sex for food, uh, or selling, for example, jewelry for food, selling family heirlooms for food, anything basically. Nothing has any value anymore except for getting to that next meal, which of course leads to a particular stigma. Uh, people are stigmatized. Even if they get out of the siege and they move to a, a place where there is plenty of food, then that stigma that you have, that you behaved in that way in that particular moment in time, keeps sticking to them. Not to mention, of course, the transgenerational trauma. Right. So uh, Mariana mentioned it already. I'm happy she did. Um, not only the immediate uh, generation that then develops an unhealthy relationship with food, but also generations later, for example. I mean, I know, for example, of the community of genocide survivors, and it's not important who, but the, the phenomenon is that the second and third generation, children and grandchildren of the survivors, the, well, the entire family was obese. And the reason why, I mean, I, I realized is because their uh, parents and their grandparents were so anxious, they had so much anxiety about food insecurity that they kept overfeeding their children. So, and that's also those people, that entire generation can also be seen as victims of that uh, of that genocide. And then finally, cultural, of course, food is much more than just fuel. I mean, it's identity for uh, a lot of people, especially in communities in the Middle East, where it's so where hospitality and generosity with food is so important. Um, then to be on social media, to be taunted and mocked by Israeli social media trolls. Uh, that we have plenty of food and how's it going in Gaza, things like that are profoundly humiliating. While at the same time, for example, refusing food, right? so the siege in itself, the famine, the imposed famine, is a form of refusing food to the Palestinians in Gaza. That in itself is a profound taboo breach of cultural norms across the Middle East. I mean, there are examples of, uh, for example, uh, also the... Uh, the um, the refusal to give pe people water, in particularly water, but that's a real, uh, real taboo breach. There are examples in which um, the militant groups, for example, they would capture uh, some of their adversaries, and and before executing uh, executing them, they would at least give them a glass of water, because that is a, a, a taboo breach that uh, that even uh, in the worst conditions of war is not uh, not disrespected. And now we see actually all of these norms are completely out of the window. Uh, and we see a Hobbesian situation over there. I mean, it's just, it's about killing what makes us human from every single direction, right? Like culturally, physically, spiritually, in terms of dignity, in terms of, you know, whatever you have it, it's, it's just... And we were talking yesterday, we were talking about how it was a cheap way to destroy people and to end up basically destroying their spirit. And I have to say, you know, when I when I was in Gaza last week, you're seeing that it it exists um, in Rafah where you have, you know, 1.4 million people, you move through this like sea of condemned souls, at least that's what it feels like. And and people are ghosts and they'll they'll say it themselves you know they they're they're moving forward but but there's no kind of there's no spark there's no energy there's no life they're so traumatized they're so depressed they're so scared they're so uncertain um and in, in all of it you know from 
from your experience though, if, if we are talking about kind of the psychological, you know, trauma of all of this, I mean, what are other ways that that manifests itself in, in a person other than, you know, overeating and especially in, in a child, like how does that manifest itself and what does that result in as, as a child is trying to, to grow up and, and mature both, you know, physically and, and emotionally? Well, I mean, kind of anecdotally from a number of like the contemporary, like modern and contemporary genocides. So, so let's take let's take that one in Yugoslavia, for example. The siege of Sarajevo is a good example. Uh, those people that were children during the siege of Sarajevo, they're by now they are in their let's say in their thirties or in their forties, and you see there, in with certain, I mean, this is anecdotal, of course, with certain individuals that I've spoken to who survived that siege is uh, it's also a major kind of change of the culture. So also in Bosnia too, hospitality, sharing food, uh, food as a communal uh, event. That whole conception for that generation of children has just changed. You know, for them, food is not something you share. Food is something that you first look after, number one. First I eat, and then maybe, or I eat by myself, or I eat in secret, for example. Uh, but the notion of that that there's an uh, there's a finite amount of food and we share it with friends or we share it with family, and that is profoundly damaged. And so the, and this is the so it's not the case that you know there's a population living in relative peace. Then there's a genocide that's unfortunate. But after that they return to this situation before the genocide and the peaceful cultural coexistence. That's not how it goes. The the culture is is profoundly into its roots is damaged because of the violence of this. Uh, this, un, this, you know, the undignified famine genocide that uh, that's going on, and we will see that. Let's say in I don't know, ten years, twenty years, thirty years, uh, we will unfortunately see the impact of that in those children that are now really small and they will grow up to become adults. And then there's obviously, of course, what it physically does to to a child's body as they're trying to, you know, grow up with with stunting, with certain deficiencies. I mean, it's it's, it's a life. It it can, it can create a lifelong disability so in you know in one sense when you actually use this this particular weapon and correct me um if i'm wrong if you're not actually killing the person due to starvation you are most certainly guaranteeing that they will not be able to grow up to be a fully functioning member of society and as such you you are still destroying them and, and destroying the population if they do manage to to survive um thank you all um to go to some questions from the audience now. Um, Nahed, I have a question directly uh, to you. The, the role of law and the legal system in Germany in covering for German complicity, what is done to counter that and what else should be happening? Okay, so, um, <clears throat> So we can see basically that uh, this is not only Israel on trial right before the International uh, Court of Justice with the Nicaragua versus Germany case. Now we also have a question of German accountability. And here basically what uh, is at stake is uh, Germany's very own uh, fulfillment of the UN Genocide Convention, which it has ratified. So it has um, obligations here. And one of the obligations uh, is its uh, duty to prevent genocide. Um, that's why Nicaragua went to the court to say that Germany is not fulfilling its duty to prevent genocide. And Nicaragua went to court to say, and Germany is complicit in genocide. And complicity is also like uh, um, uh, in Article 3, codified in Article 3 of the UN Genocide Convention. Um, now, this basically affects two things. And that's exactly the situation we're in, which is um, the delivery of arms and weapons to Israel. And at the same time, uh, the cutting uh, and defunding, basically, of UNRWA. Now, um, I think what's uh, important here is um, that uh, what's important here. Um, so it's these two kind of these two things, and I want to uh, stress that uh, when it comes to the um, uh, question of uh, humanitarian aid that Germany did defend itself by saying that it is uh, still continuing to pay to UNRWA, uh, but it's paying to UNRWA to Palestinians in Syria and in Lebanon and in Jordan and uh, to the West Bank, but it has stopped funding UNRWA uh, Gaza, which is exactly what we're talking about, right? It's these kind of people that are now um, at the risk um, of, um, of, of genocide. And I think 
I want to reiterate what the International Court of Justice said in an essay that um, the humanitarian assistance has to be um, ha has to be uh, fulfilled uh, and ensured not only without delay but in full cooperation with the United Nations. Right, so there is no way to bypass UNRWA in any way, UNRWA Gaza. Right, I think that's very important um, to stress because it's precisely uh, that institution that knows how to basically get. Uh, all the aid necessary to the Palestinians there. And I also want to say that in the provisional measures, and that's the point where there was an, a, a unanimity, I think that's important, that they decided unanimously that it's not only about humanitarian assistance, the food, but uh, as others have also already said, it's water and electricity and fuel and shelter and clothing and hygiene and sanitation requirements, as well as medical supplies and medical care. So I just want to say that, you know, when we're talking about sterilization, we're talking about all of this together, right? So it's not just done by, you know, uh, you know, airdropping like a kilo of uh, flour, which we've seen, and actually even in recent um, uh, uh, days, a child was killed basically because uh, one of these packages fell on, on, on that child. And one more thing I want to say, and that's uh, very important also with respect to Germany. It's actually in the Gambia versus Myanmar case, where for the question of genocidal intent, Germany has stressed that one of the indicators is the effect um, the hostilities have on children. Um, and with the numbers that Katrina just mentioned, right, so it's 31 persons so far, and probably the number is higher, but let's assume 31 persons killed so far by starvation and dehydration. It's 28 children, right? So if you need it to see at the pattern of contact of what is this doing, right, then the children are really, are really key here. And I think that's what makes the question of both uh, Germany's not willing to uh, prevent genocide at this point, you know, by still sending uh, arms and by cutting um, uh, funding to UNRWA Gaza, um, uh, uh, particularly kind of crucial. And so, um, and maybe just very briefly also because uh, and others have mentioned Hol Holodomor, it's really interesting how Germany and the EU, EU Parliament are willing uh, to recognize a, a genocide that happened in the past, but they're still, you know, adamantly refusing uh, to um, condemn a, a genocide that is happening, kind of that is televised in front of all, all of our eyes. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, the tricky or not so tricky bias that, you know, is is is, is quite is quite clear and tragically very, very blatant. Um, Mariana, there's there's a question that I believe you can address, which is talking about how you get reliable information from Gaza and the West Bank, uh, or is it unsafe to reveal these these sources? Yeah, I'm I'm just gonna say shortly that Isa, the person who we saw the video from the beginning, uh, also developed a website in which he started writing daily. Uh, journals uh, from what's going on in Gaza of what he's witnessing and also what he's experiencing. So one can always uh, follow um, uh, that website and look at his journals. Um, that's that's at least from my side, uh, but maybe Nahed can speak more also to other resources um, that you know of. Um, okay. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I'm, 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 ha you know, I'm happy to have first kind of a round of, of questions for everyone, and then I can add. Yeah, so I'm just going to toss this one out there. Once hunger is considered as being intentionally used as a weapon, is the perpetrator prosecuted for murder? I can try and have a go with that one, if, if, um, but feel free, any, anyone else to to jump in. Um, I think that was yeah from from somebody called Max. So thank you for the question, and actually it raises a really interesting point and um, one of the sort of unique parts in many ways to this crime, which has a parallel with genocide in that it's a specific intent crime. So what that means is that um, the crime itself, starvation as a method of warfare, uh, it has no material element that any persons or individuals have to die or starve or be dehydrated as a result. So it's not a material element that a prosecutor would need to establish. Um, that said, of course, it's important in terms of threshold and gravity and, and investigating to have that kind of information. 
So if you were um, found yourself to be in a situation where you have um, evidence that a defendant was or a perpetrator was intentionally using that and starvation ensued. And so civilians, as we're seeing in Gaza and individuals, including children in Gaza, are actually dying as a result. It would then very much depend on what the prosecutor selected in terms of the crime. So if the prosecutor intended and selected starvation as a method of warfare, that would have that that would be the crime that they would be prosecuted and held responsible for if they were found guilty at the end. Um, normally in, in international criminal law and certainly in, in my jurisdiction in the UK where I've practiced, it's very common for prosecutors to have um, alternative charges. So it may be that they would wish to pursue a murder charge as well in the alternative. Um, so it'd be very much a case of, of what the prosecutor would select, which crime would seem to fit most accurately with the factual situation that we'd be dealing with. But I think what we would be um, encouraging and what we've been advocating is that where the facts align to starvation being used as a method of warfare and where you are seeing um, that impact occurring, so where you're seeing civilians starve as a result, then uh, it would be it would make sense that that would be the crime that would be selected rather than, say, murder. <clears throat> I mean, it, it 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 does to a certain degree just sort of defy logic that we are all watching this happen and, and even having this debate when the, the content and the visuals and, and, and the information is, you know, so out there. And uh, there's there's another question that came in uh, about how everyone who's participating is pretty much in agreement that we are observing a famine genocide and that the certain institutions have testified to it. But then what what can people do to make governments change actions if they have knowingly been ignoring ICJ rulings and, and UN instructions, mandates, and, and resolutions? I can try and take that. I mean, it's a very, it's a, it's a very difficult question. Um, I mean, I think, I think the work that we have been doing around um, advocacy and, and engaging with stakeholders, engaging with prosecutors and accountability mechanisms. This is where we hope we will start to see the dial change. Once we start to get these prosecutions um, flowing and, and, and once we start to see this criminality and these patterns of conduct properly labelled, properly prosecuted, I think that's where you'll start to see um, to see change in terms of behaviour. Um, I, I think the the first step that really, in my view, is, is that we really need to continue to call this out, um, to label it for what it is, call it what it is, not to frame it under different crimes, not to frame it as, as we said before, a humanitarian disaster or a poverty issue, um, but to really label and articulate what we're seeing and to just continue that messaging, continue that advocacy, continue the works of, you know, Mariana and her colleagues who are documenting this, supporting, in, you know, interested prosecutors, interested war crimes units to really furnish them with the skills and the capability to be able to identify, to spot when this is happening and to investigate it through the proper channels. Um, and, and that's where I think we'll start to see change emerging. Um, but it's, as we said before, it's, it's a very slow process. <clears throat> And I think to Nahid's comment about Myanmar and the ICJ, I mean, we've seen this, you know, this the use of starvation was, you know, much more explicit in these proceedings that we're seeing now in Gaza. But we saw language around this in the Rohingya proceedings. We've seen it in commissions of inquiry before, for example, in Syria. Um, we're seeing it certainly in the work that we're doing in relation to Ukraine. But, you know, we're still seeing that conduct occurring and that routine um, violation of international law. The implementation and compliance with the ICJ, you know, provisional measures is, you know, it's, it's fraught and complex. But I think it, it's not the lack of compliance and the lack of um, change in terms of perpetrators and states using that I think is is not a cause or not an option for us to just say well there's nothing that can be done I mean you know we we need to sort of continue that messaging it's the same sort of parallels when you look at kind of domestic crimes and domestic you know that these crimes are going to continue you know people will continue to be unlawful what we need to do is ensure that there is a mechanism around survivors and communities fairly labelled, have an opportunity to raise their voices, to have conversations like these, 
and to be able to where possible pursue remedies for them. Um, I think that that's the, the piece where we've been really pushing because I think if we look at it from a compliance perspective, it, it feels um, incredibly bleak, really. Mariana, did you want to add something to that? Uh, no, Arua, but we can maybe answer to the question in Arabic, if you like. I can, I've already, yeah. Do you want me to translate it? Yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, someone is asking that. Uh, uh, I want to ask whether everything that is being um, photographed or being published by Gazans uh, uh, is going to be able to be used legally against Germany and other countries uh, who have been um, uh, cutting the support from UNRWA and also weaponizing Israel. Um, also, Germany, uh, is it also um, um, an evidence to complicity that Germany stopped funding the UNRWA? And thank you so much. The UNRWA in terms of, uh, as uh, Nahid was saying, uh, the support that goes to Ghazri. Uh, I'm just going to say shortly from, from the Syria um, kind of experience, uh, I think one of the most important um, acts that happened since 2011 until today, and that supported us in being able to build cases that are related to war crimes and crimes against humanity occurring in Syria, was the fact that people documented everything. Everything was documented with video, with photos, with uh, after after some years, people started getting uh, knowledge on documenting witness testimonies, on 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 documenting uh, reports from hospitals, on the 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 counts of death due to certain incidents, like for example starvation or or malnutrition. All documentations is always important in terms of investigations and in terms of criminal criminal proceedings. Not only in terms of narrative creation, that's also very very uh, important as an aspect. Uh, so from from that perspective, of course, uh, every every single piece of documentation would would or or like at least a big bunch of pieces of uh, documentations would be and can be used as evidence. And back to the question from Ugur on the uh, universal jurisdiction cases that have been opened in relation to Syria, will that happen in Germany in relation to Israel? I would say uh, that uh, I don't think so. I don't think that the German prosecution authority would in any way, shape or form open a case against any Israeli officials. I hope so. Uh, at least that's the uh, statement that we hear normally that uh, all uh, perpetrators should be held accountable and and uh, there is no discriminatory actions in terms of the nationality of the perpetrators. But I honestly think that political weight plays a huge role in that and Syria does not have a huge political weight when it comes to Germany. That would be my very honest answer. Uh, but again, I don't know. Maybe that would happen, actually. I mean, it's 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 quite interesting. Also, there's a question here from Hamad um, that's talking about the, the extent to which we can acknowledge the diminishing scope of non-governmental organizations and humanitarian institutions in addressing the plight of innocent individuals caught in global conflicts and also the viable strategies for enhancing and advancing worldwide relief efforts. I mean, when we look at what's happening in, in Gaza, and again, this kind of adds to the absurdity of all of it, because you do have starvation happening. You do have people going hunger. You do have a lack of access to humanitarian assistance. And yet you have humanitarian organizations working inside Gaza and aid that is parked just outside. So how do those dynamics kind of play, you know, play into into all of into all of this? I don't know who of you would be best suited to take that on. Can I can I just um so I'm trying to answer this question, but on route, I'll I'll, I'll you know want to talk a bit about um the question of uh intent, right, in Germany's role. Let, let me come back to this just for a second because I really wanna. Uh, stress that there is 
no, uh, so everything is factually very well documented. This is not a problem of documentation. And it wasn't in Syria, it's even less so in Palestine, obviously, right? And this is important because usually for the merits case in the, before the International Court of Justice, usually what they do is to send a fact-finding mission, uh, let's say then to Palestine, to document and report, right? That, then they would, you know, because what, what the International Court of Justice has seen so far is arguments, but they will, for the kind of the merits case, they will need to see like evidence in a report. Now, uh, it, that, that almost sounds kind of... Um, Kind of outdated, right? Because we know that you know the the, the basically we're we're seeing you know there there are our reports coming out and uh, it's very well documented. Now the question more if it's not based on facts, it's more like on the normative level. And here the question of intent. So the the German side in particular, and I think Germany here is not the only one, but obviously the one standing before the International Court of Justice is that they're refuting there's any intent. That's not what they meant. That's not really what they said, right? So it's the 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 impossibility to imagine that exactly what Mariana said and Ugo and Katrina as well. One is that genocide is not an exception. It's unfortunately rather the norm than the exception in, in the past and the present. Second, it can be committed by anyone anywhere, right? Regardless of your religion, regardless of, you know, your nationality, you know, that's a very ugly truth of who we are as 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 uh, humanity as mankind right and and then um and even then if you took away that intent though as again as i said we do have statements from early on and i'm really um also um glad that you know amongst the first ones to say this is the genocide unfolding referring to the statements are the many un special rapporteurs right they were the first to inform among amongst the many scholars but the first to inform the international community not that this is there is an intent. They do see an intent. But even if there isn't, there's a pattern of conduct. And I think um, I'm saying this because um, even if you wanted to take away the intent and the pattern of conduct, that would leave us with war crimes. But And we've already went, the Palestinians already have a case before the International Criminal Court concerning war crimes. And even there, Germany is adamant to um, in its amicus brief to the International Criminal Court, to not have the International Criminal Court um, uh, go on with the preliminary investigations, right? Even there, they don't want kind of the international law to play a role and the International Criminal Court um, to do its job because for them, it's a question of negotiations, right? So I'm just telling you that it's interesting to see, um, and again, even despite the fact there is a German code of criminal uh, of crimes against international law. So we're actually well equipped legally to some extent, to deal with these questions. This is not a question of the law. It's not a question of the normative. But it's clearly, it's clearly uh, evidence for dehumanization and practice. And, and, de and so it's devaluation of Palestinian life. It's devaluation of facts. And it's devaluation of, of the law that we're witnessing. So basically what, you, what you're saying and what you've all been saying is, and kind of what we know at this stage is that it's not necessarily an issue of the law, but rather the implementation and respect for the law. And how do you even begin to, to circumvent that? Maybe it's uh, even more than this, just, you know, but I don't want to, so maybe it's even more than this because really, I, I mean, for, for many states, what is at stake is, you know, everything that was built up after 45, right? I mean, Ugar said it, we had genocides before that, but at least now we have a UN genocide convention. We have an International Court of Justice to adjudicate over the question of, uh, of of genocide, but what we're seeing right now is the entire international liberal order imploding, right? So there is so much more at stake here because, frankly, I think the next genocide is just around the corner, right? So this is so there are many before and there will be genocides afterwards, but with the the behavior we're seeing right now and the disrespect. Um, for uh, the laws and the facts we're seeing, uh, we we know that the next genocide is just around the corner, and there will be less and less at our hands, you know, to really ask for accountability. Then, or given your you know historical perspective on on all of this, when you look to to the future, is that what you see, and do you see? an increase or a decrease in in accountability and in prosecution of of famine in in genocide well i mean that that was already pretty bleak but so let's make it even bleaker because um i mean the main challenges let's say in the next let's say half century century are going to be like climate change environmental destruction uh pressure on uh, natural resources right? so for example water i mentioned uh, 
Um, the imposition of famine also means, of course, people can't uh, or cut off from water, from potable water. Uh, was already a problem you know water was was already um a competitive problem in that in this particular region and israel was already hoarding potable water which now it made it only worse so that is probably going to continue only in the next uh, let's say decades and century um and then as for this international liberal order i mean we had a genocide convention for a reason which meant that uh, you know, anybody committing genocide and anybody can any identity and state simply can for the fact that they're human i mean that's not even a um, that's almost like a human compliment, I say, because if you're human, then you have a potential of violence in you, and any state has that. And it doesn't even necessarily matter if it's an authoritarian or, or, or a democratic one. Uh, so we see uh, uh, increasing environmental destruction. That in itself is conducive to uh, conflict and violence. Two, we see authoritarian backsliding, so there's a democratic recession around the world. Uh, and the third, three, that's also important, is that with, with every genocide, and here now I had this absolute spot on, with every genocide, the next perpetrator is thinking, aha, if that guy got away with that, then what can I get away with, right? And so the, so the Palestinians here, for example, Gaza and elsewhere, Palestinians, not only victims uh, of, uh, of Israeli violence uh, uh, against them, but they're also victims of the fact that, that the Assad regime has done away with any and all kind of moral norms uh, in the Middle East when it comes to use of uh, non-conventional weapons, when it comes to imposition of sieges and famines, when it comes to uh, you know sniping children into the street in, uh, in the street, when it comes to arbitrary detention and torture, so you name all that incredible kaleidoscope of violence that the Assad regime used, um, and rightly of course the focus was on the victims are primarily Syrian. That's true, but the indirect victims are going to be the future uh, future genocide victims because if Assad got away with that, Netanyahu was thinking I can definitely get away with this, and, and maybe a final point here is also that. The perpetrator regime, or any perpetrator regime, often has backing from a superpower, right? So the Rwandan genocide was committed and could continue for a long time because of French support. Um, the the violence the Assad regime committed uh, is has committed and is committing um, is continuing because of Russian support. Uh, the Omar al Bashir in Sudan, when he was d destroying Darfur, he, he did that with backing from uh, from the Chinese government. And here too, I mean, you know, Israel is a state that's committing all this violence. If it wasn't for the United States and their, and their almost unconditional support, then this also couldn't have continued this long. Well, you certainly not left us on an optimistic note. Um, no, but I thank you all of you for sharing your thoughts. Uh, again, this, I mean, this is such a heavy subject to be talking about, but it is a part of our reality and it is a part of our history and we cannot turn away from it, even though it does, and it might seem uh, help, hopeless and we might feel helpless, but the truth is we're not, um, not entirely. Uh, there are some ways for those of you in the audience uh, who can potentially take action to include, you know, educating yourself, a number of resources. Uh, there's an email that's going to be going out uh, with more information in it. Um, you can look into legal steps that can be taken. There's a lot of protests and actions that have been happening uh, around the world. Uh, you know, we, we had what happened in the U.S., I think it was yesterday, where, where protesters were blocking roads. Uh, there's obviously the, the boycott attempt that is happening, you know, speak out. Our voices matter, and I think what's been quite different this time to what's happening in Gaza as opposed to what used to happen in Gaza is that Gazans are telling their own story. They are their own voice right now and they're speaking out and the more that we speak out and amplify what they're saying, you know, the bigger the impact they can have. There's obviously a lot of disinformation out there. Um, so please be beware of which sources you follow. Um, you can donate to organizations working in Gaza, um, a lot of families are actually trying to get out and the cost is astronomical. $5,000 right now, um, it used to be $650 that was given to sort of a company that helped facilitate everything. So there's a lot that, that we can do and it might feel like it's small, but you know, a lot of small actions put together can sometimes lead to something bigger. Uh, so thank you all of us again uh, for joining us. Thank you to all of you who are members of the audience. Thank you to this extraordinary panel. Um, you guys are all, you're, you're all very, eloquent and and I, I deeply appreciate the work that you're doing. And again, thank you to the Syria campaign for organizing this and, and putting this together. Thank you. And thanks for the moderation, Noah, and for, for everyone's contributions. Thank you. <laughs>